education. 13. Education in every sense is one of the fundamental factors of development. No country can achieve sustainable economic development without substantial investment in human capital. It is undeniable that education enriches people's understanding of themselves and of the world. It improves the quality of their lives and leads to benefits both to individuals and to societies. Prior to the 19th century, systematic investment in human capital was not of special importance for any country. Expenditures on schooling, on the job training and other similar forms of investment in development of human capital were quite small. This began to change radically during the 19th century with the application of science to the development of new goods and more efficient methods of production. In agriculture, evidence suggests positive effects of education on productivity among farmers using modern technologies, but less impact, as might be expected, among those using traditional methods. Interestingly, Kautelia's Artashastra clearly demarcated the significance of education and the role of intellectuals in ensuring a welfare state. During the era it was the political theorist of the early Maurya period who was acquainted with the principles of Artashastra who formulated these in a text. This might have been done shortly after the death of Kautilya, in order to fill the gap left by the fact that Kautilya did not write his own text or found his own school. Kautilya's Artashastra identified the significance of training and learning. It clearly stated that training imparted discipline. Thus, the lessons of discipline could be imparted to those whose intellect had the desire to learn, capacity to listen attentively, power to grasp what was taught, to retain it in memory, discriminate between the important and the unimportant, draw inferences, deliberate and imbibe the truth and not to others. A young intellect was apt to consider whatever was told as the teaching of scientific knowledge, just as a fresh, raw object absorbs whatever material it is brought in contact with. Artashastra clearly points out that teaching wrong things was a great crime. It urged that discipline and self-control were acquired by learning the various sciences under the authoritative control of concerned teachers. Kautilya believed that only learning which results in righteousness and wealth was true learning. Persons who distinguished themselves on account of their learning, intellect, valor, and good deeds were acclaimed. Thus, Kautilya established the fact that education helped and preserved righteousness, wealth and physical pleasures. Arthashastra preached that training and learning destroyed unrighteousness, poverty and hatred. It is from learning that the intellect is formed, through the intellect skill in action, yoga, and from yoga, self-control follows. Much of our knowledge about state policy under the Maurya rule comes from the Arthashastra. Though it was written during the 3rd century BC, it is still relevant. The book, written in Sanskrit, discusses theories and principles of governing an ideal state and is not necessarily an account of Maurya administration. It categorized discipline into two kinds, artificial and natural. Instruction kriya, can be rendered only by a docile being tied to the rules of discipline. The study of science can tame only those possessed of such mental abilities as obedience, hearing, grasping, retentive memory, discrimination, inference, and deliberation, but not those devoid of such abilities. Arthashastra warned that sciences should be studied and the precepts strictly observed only under the authority of specialist teachers. In view of maintaining efficient discipline, the student should invariably seek the company of aged professors of sciences from whom alone the discipline's roots could be understood. Students were to spend the forenoon in receiving lessons in military arts concerning elephants, horses, chariots, and weapons, and the afternoon in hearing the Atiyasa. Purana, Itavarita, History, Akyayika, Tales, Udaharana, Illustrative Stories, Dharmasastra, and Arthasastra are known by the name Atiyasa. During the rest of the day and night, they should not only receive new lessons and revise old lessons, but also hear over and over again what had not been clearly understood. From hearing, sruti, ensues knowledge, from knowledge, application, yoga, is possible, and from application, self-possession, atmavata, is possible. This is what is meant by efficiency of learning, vidyasamatyam. Kautilya stated that a well-educated king, disciplined in the sciences and devoted to a good government, would enjoy the earth. Unopposed, India at the time of Kautilya continued to be famous for its medical knowledge throughout the ancient period. The doctors could perform surgical operations for cataract, hydrocele, abscesses, extraction of dead embryos, etc. 
education and training were divided into specific areas. Veterinary education. This field of medicine had developed fairly early. Since animals were regarded as part of the same cosmos as humans, it is not surprising that animal life was keenly protected and veterinary medicine was a distinct branch of science with its own scholars. Military education. In modern times, military training is usually given only by the state authorities when recruits join the army. Such was not the case earlier. The average citizen and villager was expected to be able to defend his own hearth and home. The Arthasastra expressly lays down that every village ought to be able to defend itself. That such was actually the case in several parts of India would become quite clear from the accounts of Alexander's invasions, as given by the Greek historians. In several places, the Macedonian was opposed not so much by state forces as by the whole population up in arms. There can be no doubt that in many of the republican states of Punjab, the Kathas, the Malavas, the Sibis, etc., every adult used to receive military training of a fairly high order. Military training. There were also some cities in the country, famous as centers of military training. Takshasala, situated in the northwest, had become a center of military training. Commercial education. There was considerable interprovincial and foreign trade in the ancient times. Maritime activity was considerable, and the trade with other countries was very profitable. There is evidence to show that statistics would have been taught here. Kautilya Zartashastra, while describing the duties of different officials, says that there had to be a person to mark the animals that were a month or two old or that had stayed in the herd for a month or two, the branded mark, the natural mark, the color, the peculiarity of the horns, and along with these characteristics, the recording of additions to the herd. Another person should look after 100 animals, i.e., an equal number of aged cows, milk cows, and cows with young, cows with calves for the first time, and heifers. Thus, we understand that people of ancient India were conversant with the topic. Association of Attributes In the same chapter, Kautilya has written that statistics and records about all agricultural and other properties in the village were to be maintained by officials, known as Gopas and Stanikas. Hence, we can conclude that statistics had been taught even in those times. Despite scientific, commercial and a practical educational system, the ancient Indian educational institutions were characterized by spiritual endeavors to realize a higher truth. Moral education and character building, in addition to intellectual learning, formed the essential features of such systems. Patronized centers Kings were encouraged to set up centers for higher education in various branches of learning by utilizing state income. Patronized centers like Nalanda University in Rajgriya, Bihar, Takshasala University in present Rawalpindi, Pakistan, Vikramshala University in Dharampala, Bihar were few of the leading educational centers during that era. Historians have found that Nalanda University had about 1,500 professors and 10,000 students. All these universities followed the gurukul system of teaching where students and the faculty stayed together. The universities were well known over the world as major hubs of learning, akin to Oxford and Harvard universities today, that attracted a large foreign student population. Takshasila, the most ancient university. Takshasila was the most famous seat of learning. This was where students went to complete, not begin, their education. They were invariably sent there at the age of 16 or when they came of age. Here it would be essential to mention briefly the range of subjects taught in Takshasala. L. Science, 2. Philosophy, 3. Ayurveda, 4. Grammar of various languages, 5. Mathematics, 6. Economics, 7. Astrology, 8. Geography, 9. Astronomy. 10. Surgical Science, 11. Agricultural Sciences, 12. Archery and 13. Ancient and Modern Sciences. Takshasala was also the capital of Gandhara and its history goes back into antiquity. It was founded by Bharata and named after his son Taksha, who was the ruler there. As a center for learning, the fame of this city was unrivaled. The philosophy and layout of the university adhered to the ancient Hindu beliefs of the value of natural beauty around a university. The valley is a singularly pleasant one, well watered by a girdle of hills. Numerous references show how students from far off Banaras, Rajagaha, Mithila, Ujjain, from the central region, Kosala, and Kuru kingdoms in the north country flocked there. 
The fame of Takshasala as a seat of learning was of course due to the wisdom of its teachers. Sending the sons a thousand miles away from home also proves the great concern felt by parents about good education, even in those days. As shown in the case of the medical student, Jivaka, the course of study at Takshasala extended to as many as seven years. Historical records reveal how parents felt on seeing the sons return home after graduation at Takshasala. An archery school at Takshasala had on its roll call 103 princes from different parts of the country. The students came to Takshasala to complete their education in the three Vedas and the 18 Sippas or Arts. Sometimes the students were known to select to study only the Vedas, or just the Arts. The Bodhisattva, Buddha, is frequently referred to as having learned the three Vedas by heart. Nalanda. Nalanda was the name of the ancient village now identified with modern Baragaon, seven miles north of Rajgir in Bihar. The earliest mention of Nalanda is in the Buddhist scriptures, which refer to a Nalanda village near Rajagriya with a Pavarika Mango Park in Buddha's time. Even Kautilya was once a student of this university. This university was the seat of knowledge for the world. Nalanda University offered many subjects for study, though it specialized in Mahayana Buddhism. Instructions were imparted in logic, grammar, philosophy, astronomy, literature, Buddhism, and Hinduism. Discussions in the classrooms were the usual method of teaching. B-I-K-R-A-M-A-S-I-L-A. Like Nalanda, the University of Vikramsila was also possible due to royal benefactors. The syllabus and method of teaching were controlled by a board of eminent teachers. The walls of the university prominently displayed portraits of pandits eminent for their learning and character. Grammar, logic, metaphysics, ritualism were the main subjects here. The image this university conjures up is one of a typical Brahmin with a high chignon, beard, short garments, seated on a mat in a round leafy hut, four fellow denizens of his hermitage, a cow, a crow, a kneeling doe, and a coiled snake, all living at peace as friends in the atmosphere of non-violence. Conclusion. Kautilya's Arthashastra identified the significance of training and learning. It clearly stated that training imparted discipline. Kautilya established the fact that education helped and preserved righteousness, wealth, and physical pleasures. Even though the concept of human resource development had not been specifically mentioned in Kautilya's Arthashastra, all the prescribed guidelines give the impression that he was propounding human resource development in a detailed manner, where education played a vital role. Today the common perception, even among educationists, is that institutions of learning have little connection with learning and have more to do with business or training recruits for employment as serfs in corporate life. Nevertheless, education raises people's productivity and creativity and promotes entrepreneurship and technological advances. In addition, it plays a very crucial role in securing economic and social progress and improving income distribution. The highest priority and importance should be given to education and training. Many countries are now on the brink of increasing access to secondary and higher education and in affecting spectacular improvements in the quality of education offered at all levels. More students complete the basic education and the demand for education at higher levels is similarly increasing. Previous studies have shown handsome returns to various forms of human capital accumulation, basic education, research, training, learning by doing and aptitude building. Unequal education tends to have a negative impact on the per capita income in most countries. Undeniably, as stated by Kautilya, investment in human capital especially in higher education would have a greater impact on the growth and development of the economy. Issues of relevance to contemporary India. 14. Towards higher sustainable economic growth with people welfare. Ortelia's Arthashastra, a great revelation, is primarily a guidebook for the benefit of the top management of the country. It outlines both political and economic governance norms working simultaneously as means and ends. Without political will and good governance, no economic goals can be achieved. Without economic and administrative governance, populist ambitions cannot be realized in the true spirit. The Arthashastra, a treatise on polity, economic activity, and administration, both public and private, written from the perspective of ideal, but pragmatic governance norms and in a holistic framework, was lost to us for centuries. This wonderful body of knowledge needs to be brought to the attention of the people. 
The work brings out clearly the relevance of Kautilya's thoughts and teachings to contemporary times not only in India, but throughout the world. The relevance becomes more pertinent as Kautilya's interdisciplinary work basically meets the need of creating a strong and centralized administration, which is truly benevolent to the people. Good governance in Kautilya's literature is aimed at fulfilling the welfare of the people. In the happiness of the king's subjects lies his happiness, in their welfare, his welfare. Whatever pleases him personally, he shall not consider as good, but whatever makes his subjects happy, he shall consider good. The jargon related to human resource management was not prevalent then, but its essence was widely practiced in Kautilya's times. The king should look to the bodily comforts of his servants by providing such emoluments as can infuse in them the spirit of enthusiasm to work. He should not violate the course of righteousness and wealth. Thus, he shall not only maintain his servants, but also increase the subsistence and wages in consideration of their learning and work. Kautilya believed in a welfare state, flexible labor policy, and constructive administrative procedures. Efficient administration is basic for good governance. Good governance should avoid extreme decisions and extreme actions. Kautilya recommends a strict code of conduct for himself and for the administrators. This code of conduct is useful and applicable to modern executives. The concept of trusteeship was not in fashion in the times of Kautilya. But what Kautilya preached was the highest form of trusteeship as advocated by Gandhiji. For good governance, all administrators, including the king, should be considered the servants of the people. They were paid for the service they rendered, and not for their ownership of anything. The main role of a leader is to lead by example. All the attributes spelt out by Kautilya are expected even from the present-day leaders. In fact, the working and motivation of the leaders from various segments of the economy determine the well-being of the inhabitants of the economy. The detailed emphasis on efficient law and order, effective administration, taxation, and other key functions is extremely relevant today. According to Kautilya, for an efficient government, the personnel holding various administrative posts were to be selected with great care according to the job's requirements. Kautilya was of the opinion that their abilities and sincerities should be tested from time to time. This is relevant for civil servants in the present administration as well. Kautilya said that good governance and stability go hand in hand. According to him, there is stability if rulers are responsive, responsible, accountable, removable, and recallable, otherwise there would be instability. Kautilya emphasized accountability even in a monarchy. In the present democratic setup, these qualities are very essential. Kautilya dealt seriously with the problem of corruption. He listed about 40 ways by which government funds could be embezzled by corrupt officials. However, he was very practical about the prevalence of corruption. He pointed out how difficult it was to be sure about the honesty of an officer. According to him, for good governance, preventive and punitive measures must be adopted to deter the greed of civil servants. This deserves the serious attention of relevant policy makers in the government so that a cleaner public life is ushered in. Judging by the fact that not a single person holding a high office has ever been convicted, Though several have been charged of corrupt practices, the relevance of punitive measures and enforcement norms as advocated by Kautilya becomes even more important. It is unfortunate that in India, despite over six decades of planning, an efficient and equitable water management is still a pipe dream. In this respect, Kautilya was a visionary, and had many practical suggestions to offer. In 1985, the technology mission on safe drinking water was set up, but the dream of the vast majority of people in the non-metro areas is yet to be realized. There is an urgent need to look into and implement Kautilian principles of user charges. It is indeed amazing that Kautilya, about two millennia ago, described the workings of a mixed economy. It is interesting to note that the mixed economy concept was favored by late J. R. D. Tata in the mid-1950s, as a via media between private enterprise and state ownership. The state should run a diversified economy actively, efficiently, prudently and profitably. Till now, the authorities have had a general dislike for the word profit, which did not allow entrepreneurship to flower in the country. Kautilya eulogized profit-making and wealth creation. He did not see profit-making by an enterprise as anti-labor, but, in fact, quite the opposite. 
any official, who did not generate adequate profits in crown undertakings, was punished for swallowing the labor of work. According to Cautelia, the treatment towards the labor force had to be fair, yet strict. Cautelia realized that wealth creation was crucial for establishing a welfare state. He outlined and advocated appropriate strategies for creation, protection and conservation of a nation's wealth. Cautelia laid stress on employment generation with due emphasis on relating wages to productivity. In this age of globalization, linking wages to productivity has become extremely relevant. On public finance, if the present government follows the principles as laid down by Cautelia, there would be no need to enact and implement the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act by the center and states. The rules for a healthy treasury management as laid down by Cautelia are not only for India but the entire world. Cautelia's major contribution to economic thought can be seen in the area of public finance. He attached considerable importance to financial management by the state recognizing that the financial strength of the state is critical in normal times as also in times of war, famine and other calamities. Cautelia referred to seven different sources of revenue, classifying them as routine sources, like taxes on land and commerce, and additional sources, interest and profits. At the same time, he enumerated 15 heads of expenditure. While levying taxes, he advocated fairness and equity as the basis of taxation. He also made a strong plea for avoiding discontent among the taxpayers, as the welfare of citizens was uppermost in his mind. Cautelia provided an elaborate description of how public funds get misappropriated and how such practices could be contained and controlled. The concept of subsidies and exemptions seems to have prevailed in Cautelia's times too. He indicated that these exemptions should be judiciously planned and provided to women, minors, students, disabled and others. While writing about public finance, Cautelia showed remarkable foresight and suggested ways for investments in virgin land, dams, tanks, irrigation and mining. How relevant this is even today can be seen from the mention made about the conservation of water resources in the last two union budgets. These assets undoubtedly had critical importance in Cautelia's times, from the point of view of economic planning. It is necessary to extend this logic and prepare an exhaustive list of productive assets in the context of a modern Indian economy. Cautelia's suggestions as regards investments are admirably suited to India. Cautelia treated land as a very important asset. Given the fact that this was done 2,400 years ago, it is remarkable that he advocated a scientific approach to farm operations and management. Cautelia classified land into arable and non-cultivable land. The arable land was given to the farmers for life only, and it was made sure that taxes were paid by the farmers. India, at present, is engaged in a debate about taxing agricultural income, which is still inconclusive. Cautelia has not only provided the rationale to tax agriculture, but has also advocated that rich farmers should be taxed at higher rates. In respect to taxes on agriculture, he said that extremes of either complete absence of taxes or exorbitant taxation should be avoided. Cautelia argued for maintaining data on agriculture, as this would provide a basis for revenue assessment and collection. He had suggestions about land. Records too. This is yet another subject which needs to be emphasized in the present context, as many Indian states do not have proper land records, which is an inhibiting factor when it comes to carrying out land reforms. Cautelia made suggestions for irrigation management and for provision of buffer stocks. He also realized the need to give relief to needy citizens and hence suggested that tax-free land should be allocated to people belonging to certain specified categories. It is interesting that gold and silver held great appeal in Cautelia's times too. In the wake of the famous Brazil, Russia, India and China, BRIC, report of Goldman Sachs, gold has become extremely significant today, mainly due to its intrinsic value, which no currency has. Environment protection was an integral part of Cautelian economics. Emphasis was laid on water management, forest protection, land management, etc. Cautelia advocated the concept of just price. Currently, this is a matter of intense debate, not only in India but in the entire world. The determination of the right price of oil has become a burning issue. On public sector undertakings, Cautelia wrote in the context of a monarchy and a governance that would emanate therein. 
but these are relevant yet within the purview of conventional public sector units. Arthashastra emphasized that the king should build forts, canals, roads and moats and described in considerable detail the layout of each of these infrastructural constituents. He described the duties and responsibilities of all the functionaries within the monarchy. Arthashastra also lays down the penalties to ensure the efficient discharge of responsibilities at various tiers of governance. Kautilya understood the importance of accountability and transparency, the lack of which in a number of public sector units has been a primeval reason for the proliferation of loss-making public sector enterprises. Arthashastra allowed the king to appoint spies to monitor the activities of various departments. This would have served some of the purposes of an audit. One of the central objectives of corporate governance today is to ensure certain managerial and legal provisions leading to accountability and transparency. India is poised to become a superpower, and to ensure that this happens sooner rather than later, it is imperative to surmount deterrence. One of the most recurrent obstacles that the country has had to encounter stems from the manner of governance and it is in this context that Kautilya's Arthashastra bears considerable relevance to contemporary times. A substantiated enumeration of this follows. Kautilya states, an ideal king is one who has the highest qualities of leadership, intellect, energy and personal attributes and behaves like a sage monarch or rajarishi. Among other things, a rajarishi is one who is ever active in promoting the yogikshema of the people and who endears himself to his people by enriching them and doing good to them. Yoga is explained as the successful accomplishment of an objective and Shema is peaceful enjoyment of prosperity. To possess great intellect, a king, leader, should have the desire to learn, retention, thorough understanding which reflects pursuit of truth. As regards a king's, leader's personal attributes, Kautilya states that an ideal king should be eloquent, endowed with a sharp intellect, a strong memory and a keen mind. He should be amenable to guidance. He should be just in rewarding and punishing. He should have the foresight to avail himself of opportunities by choosing the right time, place and type of action. He should know how to govern in normal times and in times of crisis. He should know when to fight and when to make peace, when to lie in wait, when to observe treaties and when to strike at an enemy's weakness. He should preserve his dignity at all times and not laugh in an undignified manner. He should be sweet in speech, look straight at people and avoid frowning. He should conduct himself in accordance with the advice of elders. Economic growth is a means to an end and the primeval goal of countries is or at least should be sustainable development. The Arthashastra was a treatise that explored the embodiments, features, and principles of an efficient political economy. It is not unusual for poverty and underdevelopment to persist despite an increase in the economy's growth rates. In essence, the reasons for this stem from the structures or rather the lack of those that have the mechanisms to transmit the benefits of prosperity in a manner that will eliminate or at least mitigate the trappings of deprivation and abject poverty. The role played by the lack of a proper mechanism with transparency and accountability has played a major part in stalling the transmission effects taking place from growth to development. Centuries ago, the prescription for sustainable development was written in the Arthashastra. Some of the most important measures are i. The emphasis on infrastructure building. b. The meticulous manner in which councillors, commissioners, and all government functionaries are selected, the standards they have to adhere to, and the system wherein these are enforced, have been comprehensively specified. By doing so, Kautilya demonstrated that he was cognizant that transparency and accountability cannot be ascribed to chance or the presumption that the individuals concerned would always act according to the dictates of integrity. He, the king himself had to possess certain attributes and was not exempt from adhering to codes of discipline. Thus, leadership was not merely about having power and position, but it meant the discharge of duties, responsibilities and obligations effectively. Kautilya may not have lived in an era of globalization, however, his classification of the various alliances or allies that a country can have and conversely the enemies or hostilities that it may be threatened by are useful. Arthashastra has very essential lessons for us when we are disparately seeking good governance in all walks of life. The stress on good and just administration, service, integrity, and accountability, etc., is immediately desired in today's turbulent times. Concluding Observations 15. 
He more one delves into the seminal work Arthashastra, the more one marvels at how current and topical Kautilya is to the present dynamic and uncertain economic and social milieu. In fact, Kautilya's work has relevance not only in contemporary India, but in the entire contemporary world. Though written in Sanskrit, which was the predominant language at that time, Arthashastra is still unique in the entire canon of Indian literature because of its unabashed advocacy of real politic and disciplined economic management. Though the general impression is that Kautilya had not written much about economics, the fact is that Kautilya, by taking a holistic and integrated approach to governance, had provided a new dimension to the field of economics, which unfortunately has remained neglected all this time. Economics works well with resource management, efficient administration, a fair judicial system, knowledgeable people with integrity, capable of taking up high positions. Another important dimension, economic growth with equity and social welfare, as suggested by Kautilya, would render sustainability to the economy's management system. His most important contribution pertains to treasury management which, as mentioned in earlier pages, was designed in a holistic way. This included the ruler being honest, committed, and truly deserving of his position, the required systems and procedures and norms that are to be observed being in place, and clearly spelt out. There should be several routes of treasury replenishment, which have to be transparently laid down. The strength of the treasury depended upon the accumulation of wealth by the state which was made possible by the fact that the king was the principal and residual owner of all the property. For example, land which was not specifically owned by individual was assumed to be the king's property. All water resources belonged to the king and users were required to pay the king for its use. What is most striking is Kautilya's ponson for pragmatic and realistic perspectives on crucial determinants of governance. It is strange that even today we continue to grapple with problems to which Kautilya had pointed straightforward solutions 2,400 years ago. This implies that at some stage, something went wrong with our approach. What Kautilya propagated was tackling fundamental problems relating not just to the economy but also to human resource management, which is not practiced in its true spirit today. Hence, there is an urgent need to revisit Kautilyan economics. The relevance of Kautilyan thoughts in the Indian economy gains another dimension when judged in the context of the general perception that India along with China is likely to drive global economy in the 21st century. The relevance of Kautilyan economics could enable India to pursue a holistic and integrated development plan. The realization of this dream requires that all areas of public policy and governance are streamlined to create an enabling and supportive environment. Here Kautilya's work would prove most useful.